you always knew that some people liked them and some people didn't. Um, and that's kind of quite varied in so much as, uh, you know, the majority of places that we went, people were always very welcoming and glad to see them. Um, but, the, you know, there was always somebody who may be an anti-monarchist at one level, all the way through to somebody who was maybe a fixated individual who wanted to do that member of the royal family harm. terms, could you explain what the role of royal protection is? Royalty protection, they're, they're a Pacific department and in my time it was called SO14, Royalty Protection, um, Specialist Ops 14. And their role was to look after members of the royal family and that department was split into three sections. There was the, the uniformed officers who were responsible for the, the physical security of the royal palaces. There was the protection officers who were responsible for the personal security of members of those royal families, so um, ultimately the bodyguards. And members of the special escort group form the third strand of the department. They are the motorcycle outriders that escort um, not just the royal family, government ministers, they also have responsibility for um, high value loads, category A prisoners back and forth court. They, they have an escort role and they're all part of, of royalty protection. How many Royal Protection Officers are working for the Royal Family and is it a case that there's one assigned to each Royal at any given time or is there multiple depending on the day? Yeah, I mean the, the model um, within Royalty Protection of how many officers deployed constantly changes. Um, yes, there are team members who are set aside to permanently work with that particular member of the family and then other members like myself support those teams. With regards to numbers, there's always, a, there's always a minimum of one, and then after that, we build it up accordingly. Now, that is a, is a foundation of threat and risk. That could be in relation to international events. It could be in relation to a local event. It could be based purely on the geography of where you're going and how many protection officers you feel you need to have a successful day. So it's constantly a sliding process as to how many you get. But when I was in Royalty Protection, we had about 107 protection officers um, across the board, which when you compare that to the Secret Service at that time, which is about four and a half thousand strong, um, you know, that thing's done in a slightly, slightly different way. I know it probably changes day to day, but could you give an insight into what a day in the life of a Royalty Protection Officer might, might look like? Yeah, I mean, a day in the life of a protection officer <sighs> varied. If you were to follow a, a protection officer around for, for a month, you'd most probably find it extremely boring because you spend a lot of time in meetings. You spend a lot of time on the planning table going through the what ifs. The last 12 months, you know, we've seen three large state occasions from uh, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee um, through to the, the Queen's funeral and then the King's coronation. You know, none of that was just thrown together. You know, as, as people talk about Operation London Bridge, Operation London Bridge has been in place since the 1960s, constantly being uh, evaluated, constantly evolving. It's the similar mentality when you're planning um, a royal visit, uh, whether that be an occasion whereby we're going to open or close something, um, or indeed on a much smaller scale, but still the same level of planning if this is a, a private visit. A protection officer's day is actually months worth of planning to get to that, to get to that point. But sometimes as a protection officer, certainly working with younger members of the royal family, that's when you uh, get to push your skills most probably to the boundaries because a lot of that planning, a lot of that planning will go out the window. It's just not possible. You know, we could be um, looking at a weekend in London, and certainly when Prince William and Harry were were younger and in their informative years, you know, very similar to lots of other people of that age. You know, we would say, you know, what's happening this weekend? Don't know yet. Okay. Uh, any idea? No. Waiting on a phone call. Which you know, on a Friday and Saturday evening 
a lot of other younger people are also in exactly the same position. Oh, we, we may be going to the cinema, we may be going to this restaurant, we may be going to this pub for a drink, I may be going to my friend's house. And then you get the phone call, no, I'm going out. Okay, where are you going? Don't know yet, but we need to head west. Chelsea, Fulham, yeah, yeah, let's go. You know, and you're, you're, you're wandering out, not 100% knowing what you're doing, which you know, really puts up the, um, or rather, you know what you're doing as a protection team, you just don't know where you're going to. Um, you worked closely with the late Queen, what was she like? Yeah, I mean, the Queen was great to work with. Um, in and around uh, the Queen's team, everything the Queen did pretty much run on rails. You know, there was a big mechanism around the Queen to support those, those visits. And, and I can remember as a, as a child, the Queen came to Swansea to open the Leisure Centre, which was, I think, around about 1977, 1978. And then many years later, the Queen went back to open the new Swansea Leisure Centre. And I was part of that protection team to actually take the Queen to, to open that Leisure Centre that I'd seen her open nearly 30 years before that. Things like that are great. You know, that's what you, that's what you remember as a, as a protection officer, you know. And you do see sides to all members of the royal family that, you know, aren't necessarily out in the public domain, you know, for argument's sake, when... Um, the Prince of Wales, as he was then, the King, you know, used to go to um, the military hospital in, in Birmingham to see the returning soldiers who had, you know, in some cases had uh, life-changing, life-shortening injuries um, because of what we'd asked them to do in, in, the, in the war on terror. And the, the King would spend all day there. You know, there was never any rush to, to leave and he would talk to everybody, you know, these young um, servicemen coming back, you know, who had lost lost limbs, you know, very much a people person, which from a protection perspective brings its challenges because, you know, he does want to go and speak to people. You know, thankfully in my day, the modern phenomenon of the selfie didn't really exist. But, you know, now that is part and parcel of any royal engagement is, is the selfie, you know, and you're putting, you know, a senior member of the royal family really close to someone, you know, and uh, also they don't want you in that picture either. So, you know, you've got to be in a position whereby you can react, but, you know, similarly not spoil somebody's kind of once in a lifetime moment as well. So you always knew that some people liked them and some people didn't. Um, and that's kind of quite varied in so much as, uh, you know, the majority of places that we went, people were always very welcoming and glad to see them. Um, but, the, you know, there was always somebody who may be an anti-monarchist at one level, all the way through to somebody who was maybe a fixated individual who wanted to do that member of the royal family harm. Somebody who wishes to um, cause you embarrassment or cause you harm only has to ever get it right once. And certainly in the, in the global 24-hour media that we now live in, that, in, that information, that incident happens immediately and is out there forever and a day. And that has massive consequences um, because everything that the UK stands for, to a certain extent, is, is on display. And in your opinion, what is the greatest threat to the royal family? I think the greatest threat is, is most probably difficult to kind of pinpoint because they're all threats, but they all have different um, connotations attached to them. You know, the greatest threat ultimately is somebody who wishes to take their life. If you look at the threat with regards to um, the single cause issue, people who wish to use the world's media for an event to highlight their events, such as the anti-monarchist movement or indeed Just Stop Oil. With regards to actions of a demonstrator, they could be very similar to the actions of a terrorist carrying an IED in a rucksack. You know, they jump across the barriers and they start to run towards the royal carriage. Okay, they're only going to unfold a banner, but at that pivotal moment, you don't know what they're going to do. And, you know, the pressure on police officers to get that decision right, to arm police officers to get that decision right, could have severe consequences. So, yeah, it is a constantly changing threat environment, you know, and as the protection officer and as policing as a whole, you've got to make sure that you are up to that response. I want to ask about the relationship between the royals and the paparazzi, especially 
after what happened to Diana. Mm -hmm. What were the paparazzi like and what were your interactions like with them? I mean, the, you know, there's the, there's the press and there's the, the paparazzi. And, you know, the press are confined by a series of um, conventions that they've, that they've signed up to. So, you know, to a certain extent, the regulated press aren't your, aren't your issue. They very much know what they can and can't do. But with regards to the paparazzi, you know, they don't, they don't play by the same rules. It, it was always difficult because I fully understand, you know, how much value there is from a paparazzi perspective to some of these photos that are taken. You know, the, the, the sheer money that is involved and, and kind of many years ago, and being with the Duke of Sussex and seeing the same guy take the same picture almost every week as we were coming out of a certain restaurant, you know, I said, look, why are you, why are you taking the same picture? You know, you must have hundreds of pictures of us. You know, I doubt it's a, I doubt it's a fashion thing to critique the, the Duke's clothing on this particular night. You know, why, why are you taking the same photo over and over again? Um, and the gentleman just simply replied back to me, this may be the last picture of him alive. And that to me is worth a lot of money. Did you ever feel like any members of the royal family were frustrated with constantly having to be protected and accompanied everywhere they went? No, I don't think so. I think it's most probably, because the royal family get cradle to grave protection, it, it's kind of what they know. Most probably the only different scenarios that those people that marry into the royal family. Um, you know, that is most probably a, a bit of an adjustment, but then you work, as a team, you work all around that to make sure that they are comfortable with what they're getting. Um, you, you kind of fully understand why you're there. You, you get that these people, your principals want to have a, as much of a normal life as possible. And you, you have to facilitate that. Um, you know, the easiest thing in the world is just to say, we'll stay in, don't go out. You know, we've got big fences, we've got kind of policemen with guns on the outside, you know, everything's fine and we'll bring everything to you. That's not realistic. Senior members of the family still want to kind of function. They still want to go and see, you know, other friends, other family members. They still want to go and do things outside of the official kind of capacity. With regards to Harry and Meghan, obviously they stepped back as serving royals. Did you ever see that coming from Harry? Um, in all honesty, no. But then, you know, the latter part of, um, the years, the, the involvement um, and his relationship and marriage to um, the Duchess of Sussex, I wasn't involved in that. So, you know, I kind of knew him when he was a, um, a young prince, you know, and, and no, I kind of couldn't, couldn't see that. You know, I thought he was very, very committed to the family, very extremely committed to his military career. They're the only ones that can evaluate that decision to kind of step away from the royal family. I mean, I think if you look at the purely my um, side of things, the protection side of things, then, you know, they've stepped away from that, away from having royalty protection that certainly from the Duke's perspective, you know, he's had since he was born. You know, it, it's an extremely emotive issue um, on, on, all, on all sides, you're not just that of the Sussexes. You know, it, it's an emotive issue of um, the Metropolitan Police Service who are ultimately the deliverers of that, that protection. And, and from the, the taxpayer side of things, you know, who's going to pay for it? But then the flip side of that is, you know, you are talking about the king's son. You are talking about the future king's brother. Um, he is a military veteran having served two tours of Afghanistan. There is a duty of care issue attached to that as well, based on threat and risk. But, you know, there are other members of the royal family who um, no longer have police protection and indeed have private protection. So, you know, it's not, it's not the first time, but certainly, you know, it was their decision and they're the only ones that can evaluate whether that was a positive or negative move. Do you think they're a close family? Um, again, you know, from my experience, yes. As a family, their, their family life is, is, is under the microscope. It's, you know, drawn out in the public kind of gaze. You know, there's always interaction. You know, when you look at you know, summer court in Balmoral, uh, Christmas court in Sandringham, you know, all the family kind of are there, you know, they all interact kind of with each other. But, you know, as with all families, you know, they have their kind of disagreements and they have their um, time that they want to maybe spend away 
from each other. In the event of a, like a hypothetical attack, as a protection officer, are you expected to put your life in front of the royals? Um, yes, there is the Hollywood view of, you know, kind of standing in the way, taking the bullet. But, you know, really, you should see lots of these things before they kind of happen. That's, that's why you've been trained to that level. That's why you're there, okay? I'm not naive enough to say that you're gonna, you know, stop it every single time because something could take your attention away and you could, could, have, could miss that. But ultimately, I suppose there is a consideration that that's what you may have to do to provide kind of effective body cover. I mean, if you're looking at, you know, were there ever that kind of life-threatening moment, then no, I never had one. Um, you know, far more, uh, more life-threatening moments on the firearms team and, and on, the, on the TSG. So, you know, I never had, you know, some of the, the critical incidents that we've had, you know, as royalty protection as a department, you know, with the Princess Royal being uh, attempted kidnap on the Mall, um, Marcus Sargent um, shooting at the Queen, trooping the colour, uh, the, the Prince of Wales as he was then in Australia. I never had any of those moments, you know, thankfully. Um, you know, you have long days, you know, and sometimes, you know, those long days, you know, certainly when you're doing things like Wales Week or Scotland Week, you know, it just, it's constant, you know, and you're rolling into it. Um, you know, your royal walkabout is your critical time, you know, and, and the first time I ever did that was down in Brighton um, with the late Queen and the late Duke of Edinburgh, and they went down there um, for the day, and I got back in the car, having only done a 15 minute walkabout and I was just physically and mentally drained. The protection officer I was with just looked at me, you know, and said, it'll get better as time goes on. But, you know, fortunately for me, I never had a critical situation. But a lot of that is because of the planning that goes into your event, um, the support that you get given um, by other stakeholders and, and, and other police officers as well for your event. How long in total did you work as a Royal Protection Officer and why did you make the decision to leave? So I was a Protection Officer from 2007 to 2013 and then um, I made the decision to leave Metropolitan Police Service and have a look at what the, the private sector would be like for someone with my skill set. You know, and that's when I set up Trojan Consultancy. Now we're a, a team of former police officers. I'm very fortunate that everybody on the team are people that I worked with, trained or both. So that's really good. I know everybody's um, skill set, but I also know everybody's personality as well. Um, it's, it's different. You know, whilst the work is, is the same, okay, there's some things you haven't got. We haven't got the, the badges and the guns anymore, but, you know, we've got the vast experience. You get to meet some nice people. You get to work for some nice people. You get to go into nice environments. Okay, you can't get completely absorbed by it. You can't get red carpet fever, as we used to call it, and, you know, think that actually the principal's life is your life. You know, you're, you're there to support them in exactly the same way as the, um, as the PA, as the chef, as the gardener. So you firmly got to have an understanding of your position. And again, I think, you know, with Trojan Consultancy, we, we have that understanding because we've, we've spent so many years working with senior members of the royal family, um, prime ministers, senior government ministers, people coming into the UK who require kind of protection. And whilst you, you know, might be you know, going to the theatre this evening and then going to a, a five-star Michelin restaurant and then you'd you know, drive home in the Bentley and, and you know, put your principal back into their £30 million house, you, know, you then go home and finish because you've handed over to, to another team to take on the rest of it. You know, you're back at the school gate tomorrow morning dropping your your children off talking to the other dads and you know the next meal you have is a Nando's. On this particular occasion we went into Prince Andrew's bedroom and his apartments and on his bed was 72 teddy bears on his bed. The maids have to put them back exactly like it's in that picture. If they don't, he shouts and screams. 